or getting something objectively wrong about what the world demands of her. Of a person who claims not to like sex or chocolate, we can happily say, how curious, that person is certainly quite different from me. Of someone who flouts the norms of fashion, we can happily say, how amusing. But that's just the reaction we can't have, we don't have, and we can't sustain towards someone who engages in slavery, or child abuse, or even someone who tolerates someone who does. Now, an intellectual tradition reaching back to at least the Thrasymachus in Plato's Republic can be understood as denying that there is really any intelligible distinction to be drawn here. But that claim fits rather badly, I think, not only with our moral phenomenology, but also with the results of empirical research on human moral psychology. Consider a recent study comparing young children's attitudes towards moral and aesthetic properties to those concerned with properties like icky, yummy, and boring. In that study, four six-year-old children were asked questions of the following sorts. Now, think about a long time ago, before there were any people. There were still grapes, just like the grapes now. Way back then, before there were people, were grapes yummy? You know, I think it was good for the monkey to help the other monkey. Some people don't like it when monkeys help each other when they're hurt. They don't think it's good when monkeys do that. Would you say that when one monkey helps a hurt monkey, that is good for some people? or good for real. Now, interestingly, although the children regarded none of the properties as depending on the presence of humans, grapes were yummy, roses were beautiful, even before anybody was around, they nonetheless sharply distinguished properties that did or did not depend on subjective preferences. That is, the children claimed that yummy or icky things are only yummy or icky for some people, but things that are good are good for real. This finding by itself might be open to interpretation, but it simply complements a much larger body of literature, revealing an extremely robust cross-cultural tendency to distinguish genuinely moral from merely tra conventional transgressions. Whoa, 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 back. Uh-oh. Okay, you're going to have to take my word on what this slide says. We did have to switch computers, I'm sorry about that. So I may be filling in for you on what you're seeing some of the time. Uh, so what you're seeing here is the claim. <laughs> uh, it is essentially a description of the moral conventional uh, distinction, right? So the, the moral conventional distinction is one that uh, children draw as early as the third year of life, and there's a cluster of properties that are associated with it. Moral transgressions are regarded as more serious, more uh, liable or deserving of punishment. Moral norms are regarded as more generalizable. Uh, that is to say, applicable in other countries as well, in other historical periods, applicable to people whether they care about them or not, uh, and also as binding independent of any conventional authority or decree. So uh, children will tend to allow that it's okay to wear pajamas to school if the teacher says it's okay, but insist that it's not okay to hit another child no matter what the teacher says about it. Perhaps surprisingly, this tendency is evident even in the attitudes of Mennonite and Amish children and adolescents towards religious commandments and God's authority. 100% of those subjects said it would be okay to work on a Sunday if God said so, but only 20% said it would be okay to steal if God said so. Intriguingly, the only people who don't seem to recognize the distinction between moral and merely conventional transgressions are psychopaths. Psychopaths treat all norms and rules as merely conventional. That is, they understand the practical need to learn about other people's preferences. And but whether those are formally codified or not, and to know how other people are going to react when those are violated. But they simply don't see any difference apart from the likely reaction of others between rules about what to wear at school and what fork to use and rules prohibiting the rape and murder of human beings. Treat all of those rules as conventional. These findings strongly support the robust phenomenological distinction between the way we represent or experience the, <coughs> the demands of morality and mere conventions or subjective preferences, no matter how strongly held. And it's that distinction that I think is the most puzzling feature of human moral psychology, or moral phenomenology, from an evolutionary point of view. Now, it's perhaps an implicit recognition of the importance and centrality of this difference that's led so many moral philosophers, among others, to be so very dissatisfied with existing efforts to try to explain human moral psychology by appealing to the existence of what are sometimes called pro-social emotions and behaviors elsewhere in nature. Any number of primatologists, cognitive scientists, and evolutionarily minded philosophers, this is Franz Wall, 
recent book that had some of this out between interested parties. But any number of those folks have been quick to point to evidence of such prosociality in other organisms, especially in non-human primates, and to suggest that at least the foundations of human moral psychology are thereby revealed to exist elsewhere in the animal kingdom and to be explicable in relatively straightforward evolutionary terms. But as Richard Joyce has recently noted, this falls far short of showing that other organisms have anything remotely like this most distinctive feature of human moral psychology. He concedes that chimpanzees have clearly been shown to exhibit pro-social inhibitions, aversions, and inclinations. But, he asks, where's the morality? None of the above attributions, nor the sum total of them, amount to a chimpanzee thinking of a negative response as deserved, or supposing an act to be a transgression, or judging a behavior to be appropriate, or considering a trait to be virtuous, or assessing a division to be fair. How does one move from having inhibitions to making judgments about prohibitions? From disliking to disapproving, from desiring to regarding as desirable. Of course, it may well be that other, or, sorry, let's oh, we'll look at one, one more example, um, partly because it's so moral, she seems so disappointed in me when I look at this picture. <laughs> um, I've let her down somehow, it's very clear. The, uh, but she, she's echoing a, a similar, similar complaint to Joyce's, right, when she says, morality is expressed most obviously in the capacity to act from what we familiarly call a sense of obligation, grounded in consciously held principles of good or right action. I think that that, the human capacity for normative self-government, and not just good social behavior, is the thing whose evolution needs to be explained. Now, of course, it's possible it even may well be that other organisms also experience such pro-social emotions or behaviors as normatively appropriate, as demanded from them by the world itself. But moral philosophers, I think, have been right to insist that simply demonstrating the presence of pro-social emotions and behavior does little to establish either that such behavior is motivated in other organisms by any sense of obligation and or prohibition, rather than inclination and aversion, and certainly nothing to explain why, even if this is so. Furthermore, I think, familiar positive proposals concerning the evolutionary function of human moral psychology do little or nothing to explain this crucial feature of our own moral experience. Nothing about the idea that moral attitudes are conversation stoppers that terminate deliberation about what to do, that's an old idea of Dan Dennett's, or that they allow us to track and manage reputations, or that they motivate punishment or that they serve as honest signals of commitment to carry out threats or promises, none of that goes the slightest distance towards explaining why sufficiently strong subjective preferences could not do these jobs just as well or better than moral judgments we experience as demanded from us by the world itself and binding on other people whether they care about them or not. Extant evolutionary discussions of our moral psychology seem to me to fail quite spectacularly at explaining why moral demands can better do the job that we need them for if they're externalized or objectified in this way, in large part because the need to explain this fundamental aspect of human moral phenomenology typically goes unrecognized in the first place. What I want to consider, then, is not evolutionary explanations for why we prefer interacting with kind and generous conspecifics to cruel and selfish ones. That's easy but why we treat the demands of morality as anything more than such preferences, as anything more than what we happen to enjoy or find appealing, the way we regard our preferences for keeping our heads dry and our tummies full. Let's first consider Joyce's own explanation of this propensity. Though I think his account is deeply mistaken, I think it's seeing exactly how and why it's unsatisfying will help us get to a more appealing and a more revealing account of the matter. Joyce begins with the suggestion that our general tendency to externalize or project features of our experience, generally, is a simple matter of evolutionary efficiency or expediency. And he seeks to illustrate that explicitly with regard to sensory qualities such as color or pain. We don't project pain <coughs> because the point of pain is to orient us towards a problem with the body, not towards features of the world that cause pain in us. But we project the redness, warmth, and crackling sound of the fire into or onto the world as we experience it, because there's absolutely nothing to be gained by representing these qualities instead, simply as our subjective responses to the fire's sensation-inducing properties. Here's what he says. There would be no fitness advantage in experiencing a world like that. 
A perfectly adequate and simpler solution is if our experience presents itself as being of the world, of the fire being red, hot, and crackling. The least complicated setup, Ceteris Paribus, is for a creature's perceptual experiences to be as of a direct acquaintance with aspects of the world. For finding ripe fruit, avoiding leopards, locating and impressing, impressing prospective sexual partners, raising children, napping a tool, and so on, sensory experience that wore its mentalistic nature on its sleeve would be a pointless extravagance and a distracting hindrance. Projectivism on this view, far from being an extravagance, is the predictable result of natural selection's tight-fisted efficiency. And that's the idea. Now, on this account of the matter, we project moral qualities into the world, regarding our reaction to a particular behavior as appropriate, and the behavior as deserving our praise or blame, for instance, because this is just phenomenologically simpler than representing such judgments to ourselves as subjective responses to the world, or as subjective responses to states of affairs, and because doing so serves equally well to motivate the sorts of fitness-enhancing behaviors that our dispositions to moral judgment produce. Joyce goes on, however, to suggest that in the specific case of moral projection, we must also recognize that moral considerations will actually motivate the appropriate behavior more effectively if their phenomenology is objective in this way. Because we'll be more strongly motivated by our moral judgments, if we take them to be simple perceptions of the world's own qualities, rather than if we take them to be our subjective reactions to it. Now, this second aspect of Joyce's case seems to me to turn on a confusion. Perhaps it is true that for creatures who already regard moral judgments as demanded of us by the world itself, such considerations motivate behavior more effectively than subjective preferences of comparable strength would. But the question is, how and why we came to experience moral demands in this way in the first place. And in any case, what we want is not the strongest motivation we can get, but the right level of motivation. They're only part of a deliberative uh, process. And it's clear that mere subjective states can be as strongly motivating as anything else. After all, pain is paradigmatically a mere subjective response to the world. But I can assure you, that avoiding my own pain avoids me like, or, or, uh, motivates me like nobody's business, as strongly as anything else you like. There's absolutely no reason a subjective state can't motivate behavior to whatever extent or degree that you like. So the need for effective motivation simply doesn't help explain why we externalize, or in Joyce's terms, project moral demands. This leaves us with the appeal to the efficiency or expediency of natural selection. That I reject as well, but to see why there's a more, ultimately a more convincing and more interesting account of the matter available, we need to first take a closer look at the biology of cooperative, altruistic, and exploitable behavior more generally. So as most of you know, the existence in nature of what we now call biological altruism constituted one of the most serious and resilient challenges for Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection. No matter what mechanism brings it about, that one organism acts so as to reliably contribute to the fitness of another at some cost to its own fitness. It seems for all the world that any reliable disposition to behave in this sort of altruistic fashion would clearly be outcompeted by a tendency to behave instead in any given context in ways that advance one's own fitness at the expense of that of other organisms, and thus that any heritable foundation for such behaviors or any mechanisms producing them would be selected against in evolutionary competition, and ultimately eliminated from any evolving population in nature. In the famous Prisoner's Dilemma game, I'm assuming familiarity with this, but, um, but I think you'll see how it works even if you're not. Uh, if my partner defects and informs on me, right, I'm better off if I informed on him too. I think it's five years instead of 20. But even if my partner remains silent, if my partner cooperates and remains silent, I'm still better off defecting on him because no time at all in jail is better than even the comparatively short term, uh, uh, short period I would spend in jail uh, if we both remain silent. So the point is, and this is the, this is the crucial thing about the prisoner's law, right? Uh, I'm better off defecting no matter what she does. I'm better off defecting no matter what. And it seems that that's uh, the thing that, that makes it seem like cooperative dispositions might be impossible to sustain in any population subject to natural selection. If you remove the cognitive gloss here, 
You have the stru a structure similar to many kinds of interactions between organisms in natural settings. We're all better off if we all jump in and defend the nest uh, together. And we're worse off if we allow predators to ravage the nest instead. But best of all for me is to let you guys successfully defend the nest while I hide in the woods or cheer you on from the sidelines. Right? And of course, if you guys aren't going to defend the nest, worst of all is for me to be the only guy there when the predators come. Right? So again, I'm better off defecting no matter what you guys do. Since it's in each, that, that cooperative defense scenario it isn't a prisoner's dilemma, but it has that same feature. Since it's in each agent's interest to defect, we should wind up with universal, universal defection, even though we would all be de better off if we could somehow ensure universal cooperation instead. And yet many organisms seem stubbornly unimpressed with this logic. Vertebrate monkeys continue to give alarm calls to the group, even when they would be safer to remain silent. Vampire bats, who've hunted successfully on a given night, regurgitate blood meals to those who have failed. Crows and a no, quite a number of other birds engage in group defense of their nests. And organisms quite often play cooperative strategies and recurring games of interaction in nature, structured like the prisoner's dilemma, and in other circumstances in which it seems hard to see how such dispositions to cooperate in exploitable ways could get off the ground evolutionarily or remain stable against selective pressures to exploit them, even if they did. But when evolutionary biologists rolled up their sleeves and got to work on the problem, they found a number of broadly applicable patterns of interaction that seemed to allow cooperative behavior among players of a game like the Prisoner's Dilemma to remain evolutionarily stable after all. The patterns of interaction that can achieve this now have famous names like kin selection, reciprocal altruism, and group selection. But in a deep and important sense, all of these ultimately turned out just to be different versions of the very same basic mechanism, namely correlated interaction. As Brian Skirms has emphasized, what the evolutionary stability of altruistic or exploitable cooperative behavior fundamentally requires is that there be some mechanism in place to ensure that it's more likely that cooperators interact with one another than with members of the population at large. That's what it really takes for otherwise exploitable dispositions towards cooperative behavior in games like the Prisoner's Dilemma to be evolutionarily stable. And the various distinct mechanisms that ensure the persistence of altruistic behavior in nature are just different ways of achieving that correlated mm -hmm. interaction. As soon as we allow correlated interaction between cooperators, it becomes possible for cooperators to do better on average and on the whole than defectors, even when both types are present in the population. Uh, <clears throat> right? Correlated interaction uh, ensures that cooperators are going to do, well, let's put it this way, cooperators do better when they interact with other cooperators than defectors do when they interact with other defectors. And correlated interaction is what keeps interactions between cooperators and defectors with uh, low payoffs to the cooperators and high payoffs to the defectors relatively rare. Right? How rare do they need to be? That depends on what the payoffs are. But correlated interaction is what you need. So nature's revealed a fascinating variety of ways in which correlated interaction can come about in naturally occurring populations, ranging, ranging from chimpan bacteria to chimpanzees. Everything from simple population viscosity or structure. After all, if the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, then the next tree or the next bacterium over is more likely to be a cooperator if I am. To the most cognitively complex forms of signaling, individual recognition, recollection of interaction histories, and conditional strategies of interaction. So the story about altruism and exploitable cooperative behavior has a happy ending. What seemed like a stubborn and troubling empirical anomaly for evolutionary theory actually drove us to new discoveries about the diverse ways in which evolution can work. And in the end, we came to appreciate something quite deep, important, and even predictably powerful about the structure of behavioral interactions in natural settings. But nothing about that happy resolution yet enables us to explain our distinctive tendency to externalize moral demands or distinguish such demands from mere subjective preferences. For human cooperators could just as easily and effectively correlate their cooperative interactions by means of preferences for interacting with one another no less subjective in character than their preferences for chocolate ice cream over vanilla. Such merely subjective preferences for interacting with other cooperators could just as easily and effectively motivate us to keep track of individual histories of interaction, other reputational information, 
to use conditional strategies for interacting with cooperators and non-cooperators, respectively, to even to punish non-cooperators for violating our subjective preferences, or to ensure correlated interaction in whatever way you like between cooperators. Thus, we can't explain the externalization of moral demands or our distinctive attitude towards moral as opposed to conventional transgressions as required for or even as more effective than subjective preferences would be in generating or sustaining the correlated interaction required for cooperative exploitable behavior to be evolutionarily stable. To understand the externalization or objectification of moral demands, I suggest, we will need to examine some broad ways in which the structure of human cooperation differs from that of most and perhaps all other organisms. First and foremost, we should note that the cooperative behaviors we find in non-human organisms typically occur in specific, recurring, stereotyped behavioral contexts. Although vervets give risky alarm calls, vampire bats share food, crows engage in group defense, none of these organisms cooperate systematically across all of these contexts, nor do they reap further potential dividends of cooperative behavior <coughs> by cooperating in unfamiliar contexts, or those that arise infrequently. Exploitable cooperative or altruistic behavior in most and perhaps even all other species appears to be limited to a distinctive range of recurring, well-defined situations in which the relative costs and benefits of particular cooperative behaviors were sufficiently stable to selectively favor specific dispositions to engage in those behaviors and to favor the emergence of mechanisms to ensure correlated interaction among such context-specific cooperators. But this is simply not how human beings cooperate with one another. Children as young as 18 months reliably help an, an adult stranger achieve a goal by opening a cabinet when the adult's hands are full, or retrieving a spoon by opening a flap on a box of which the adult is unaware. And they do that without encouragement or reward, without the adult stranger asking for help, or so much as looking, even looking at them. Chimpanzees simply don't demonstrate anything like this degree of helping behavior across variable contexts. Even with human caretakers they've known all their lives, much less with other chimpanzees with whom they're less cooperative than human caretakers they've known all their lives. Uh, it's also true children as young as six months will reach out to pick up or touch a wooden doll that helps another one climb a hill in preference to one that hinders it from climbing the hill. And three to five year old children reliably choose a reward for themselves and the experimenter over a reward for just themselves, while chimpanzees choose at random between a food reward for themselves and one for themselves as well as a familiar group member. Human beings may well be the only creatures that do not need to evolve cooperation for specific contexts, patterns, or games of social interaction. Our inclinations to cooperate, at least with members of what we recognize as a well-defined in-group, constitute a sort of default setting for normal humans across most forms of social interaction. We can learn not to cooperate with a particular group member and or in a particular set of circumstances, but our natural instinct is to find ways to cooperate with in-group members unless and until this is shown to be imprudent or lead to exploitation in some other way. In a phrase, we are default domain general cooperators. Now the benefits of such default domain general cooperation seem evident, especially for creatures whose behavior is as generally plastic as ours is. For it allows us, and allowed some of our hominid ancestors, to reap the considerable advantages of cooperation in a much wider range of settings, including those that occur in free or are even unprecedented. There are many unfamiliar as well as familiar things that a group of hominids working together can do far more effectively, quickly, efficiently, safely, or otherwise better than if each worked alone. And of course, there are many things that a group of hominids working together can do that <coughs> hominids working separately could never reliably accomplish at all. But the penetration of this niche also selectively favored the externalization of moral demands, I suggest. For default, Domain general cooperators also face enormously elevated risks of exploitation. Even once formed, any such group of cooperators would be persistently vulnerable to invasion by a mutant type who receives the benefits of such default domain general cooperation, but does not pay the costs 
involved in the nearly limitless, creative, and novel forms of cooperative social interaction in which humans engage with in-group members by default. Because of this open-ended and indefinitely exploitable character, default domain general cooperators cannot afford to learn simply by trial and error who is a desirable cooperative partner in particular games of social interaction, or to simply keep track of who's reliably been a good cooperative partner in some particular delimited past context of interaction. A disposition to cooperate indiscriminately in any novel set of circumstances unless and until this proves to be unwise is a ticket to sustained serial exploitation in each new and unfamiliar context of interaction. Default domain general cooperators must instead identify those who are desirable potential cooperative partners in general and determine in advance who can be trusted to cooperate in particular, especially novel, circumstances so as to interact with only that sort of partner or at least to risk cooperative, altruistic, and inform uh, uh, exploitable forms of behavior only when interacting with such a partner. Once again, then, the evolutionary stability of cooper cooperation or altruism is ensured by correlated interaction between types. But for domain general default cooperators like us, whose behavioral plasticity gives them so many opportunities for cooperative interaction and therefore for being exploited in novel, unfamiliar, and infrequently occurring contexts, the need to ensure that such interactions are correlated in each no novel context from the outset is radically more pressing. And I suggest that our moral psychology is the core mechanism by which such correl correlated cooperative and exploitable interaction is established and maintained between human beings. How does our moral psychology work to secure this result? In essence, we demand that others share our own attitudes and reactions towards particular kinds of behavior by themselves and by third parties, including observed, reported, rumored, and even imagined or counterfactual instances of such behavior. On, or what? On pain of being judged by us not to be desirable cooperative partners. We are inordinately interested not only in the who, what, where, when, and why the behavior of others, but also in discussing our own and our interlocutors' attitudes towards, rationales for, and justifications for those behaviors, an activity colloquially called gossip that is extremely widespread in traditional hunter-gatherer societies just as it is in our own where, among other things, it feeds the coffers of those who produce so-called reality television. I, I really, I, I don't mean that to be cute. I think this is a lot of what drives people's interest in artificial communities and the behavior of other people within them. Our remarkable and perhaps otherwise puzzling interest in all of that, I suggest, ultimately stems from the assistance it offers in assessing the desirability of potential cooperative partners. As Robin Dunbar has noted, Humans devote an enormous proportion of their gossip to norm violations within their own social group, particularly free riders, cheats, and liars. And we hold others responsible for sharing our own reactions or attitudes towards particular forms of behavior on pain of being judged undesirable cooperative partners, either in general or in a particular context of social interaction, interaction like hunting or defense or collective child rearing or forming coalitions. This is ultimately the difference between ice cream and Nazis. I do not demand that you share my preference for chocolate ice cream over vanilla, but I absolutely demand that you share my attitude towards Nazis, or slavery, or selfish hunting partners, or cowardly defenders of the tribe, or unreliable coalition partners, on pain of being disqualified as a desirable potential cooperative partner, or at least of having this counted as evidence towards such a disqualification. And the more closely I discover by word and by deed that you share my own attitudes, the more desirable I will find you, other things being equal, as a potential partner in exploitable cooperative interactions. Of course, disqualification can also take on a continuum of forms. Uh oh, we're missing another one. Um, yeah, but we can punt. So just look at this. Uh, <laughs> it'll do, that'll do. Um, <clears throat> Disqualification can take on a continuum of forms, from simply regarding one potential partner as more desirable or less desirable than another, to refusing to engage in a wider and wider range of cooperative or exploitative forms of social interaction with a particular person, all the way up to that person's complete ostracism or physical expulsion from the community, an extremely serious punishment throughout most of human history. 
Moreover, note that the demands imposed by such shared reactions and attitudes can be iterated indefinitely. With moral commitments of increasing seriousness, I may demand that you share not only my attitude towards the behavior itself, but also, for example, towards others who do not share our attitude, towards those who support or tolerate those who do not share our attitude, and so on. The irony, ooh, we're missing something important, but picture Joyce back up there for a second, right? The, the irony in Joyce's appeal to natural selection's tight-fisted efficiency, then, is that we project colors and the like because we can expect broad, intersubjective agreement in our perceptions of them. There's evo every evolutionary incentive to perceive colors just as others do, while no such thing is true in the case of exploitable moral attitudes. But discrimination and desire, degree of desirability and disqualification imposed on potential partners can nonetheless serve to carve out networks of cooperative interaction, even among those who live in a single community. Within the group, there will be thus I those I trust implicitly in absolutely any sort of novel opportunity for cooperative interaction and potential exploitation. Those I trust to some degree or in some such contexts and not others. And those whose past behavior, expressed attitudes, or record of failing to live up to their expressed attitudes convinces me that they're simply undesirable cooperative partners to core. Perhaps even that it is dangerous for the community to tolerate their continued presence within it. Now, one advantage of this account, I think, is that it doesn't rely on the need for individuals to enforce costly punishments, like exclusion from the community, in order to get off the ground in the first place. Such punishment is, as is well known, itself a sort of second-order altruism, because the costs of inflicting punishment on an offender will typically far outweigh the benefits to the punisher herself of the absence of the offender or their reformed behavior, future behavior by that particular offender. Of course, it's easy to stabilize cooperation if non-cooperators are punished, but this simply invites the very same problem about how dispositions to punish can themselves be stabilized. But in this case, <clears throat> all but the most extreme forms of punishment are ones in which the punisher is also directly pursuing her own immediate self-interest. The punishment of non-cooperators consists simply in their being excluded from opportunities for cooperative interaction by a wider and wider range of community members. And each community member is simply protecting herself from the exploitation of non-cooperators by exacting such punishment. The selective pressure to identify such undesirable cooperative partners is also self-reinforcing. It becomes stronger as the pool of available potential cooperative partners comes to consist of an ever higher proportion of such undesirable partners already rejected by other members of the community. And the emergence of more extreme forms of punishment, like expulsion or physical violence, or even capital punishment, can await the explicit recognition or agreement that irredeemably or persistently undesirable partners are a threat to the public welfare that can be addressed by coordinated interaction, interaction at the community level that is nearly cost-free for each individual member. After all, the opportunities for cooperative interaction that each member foregoes by expelling or killing a persistently undesirable cooperative partner are opportunities that she did not want in the first place. And it's relatively easy for a large group working together to forcibly expel or kill a single member. But it seems that we now have to face the challenge I have repeatedly leveled at other attempts to understand moral psychology in evolutionary terms. Namely, why must the demands of morality be externalized in order to do the job that we're asking of them? If this is ultimately why we have moral cognition in the first place, why do we, as Hume so famously put it, gild and stain the world with colors borrowed from internal sentiment? Or as generations of theorists since have put it, why do we project moral properties and demands out into the world itself? Once again, it seems that we could represent our own moral attitudes as mere subjective preferences and simply be further disposed to seek out and selectively interact with those who happen to share the same subjective preferences that we ourselves do, to exclude or punish those who violate our subjective preferences in ever more dramatic ways, and so on. Why should we think that in addition, those who do not act in accordance with our attitudes have done something objectively wrong? To answer this thorny question, we must first note that the language of projection is here somewhat misleading. Despite the obvious appeal of the metaphor, we do not literally project moral considerations and demands out into the world in just the way we project properties like colors onto the objects we see them as having. We do not think that we literally see or perceive 
moral properties, like the goodness of a person, or the justice of a distribution, or the rightness of a course of action, in the way that we do colors. We do not assign them spatiotemporal extensions or locations. We don't think of ourselves as having a sensory channel uh, for receiving moral input that could be damaged or occluded in the way that vision or hearing can be. We don't think that whether an agent or an entity has a given moral property is simply a separate question from whether we care or our own attitude towards the agent or object. And unlike colors, recognizing the supervenience of moral on non-moral properties is a criterion of competence in their ascription. We don't understand moral properties, we don't understand those about them, whether in those terms or not. In these ways, moral properties form a sort of hybrid category with some characteristics, whoa, yeah, we'll miss another one, all right. Some characteristics shared uh, by our representations of objective features in the world, and others shared instead by what we think of as our subjective reactions to states of affairs in the world. Part of the suggestion here, then, is that what it is to treat moral demands as objective is simply to be prepared to apply them to people in other times and places, whether they care about them or not, and independently of any conventional authority or decree. And most importantly, to require that others share them if we're to judge them to be desirable or even sometimes just acceptable cooperative partners in exploitable forms of social interaction. Pick up the stick from the other end, we have an abundance of subjective preferences and affective attitudes about lots of things, but we need to distinguish those that we should regard as merely our subjective preferences and attitudes, from which others may freely demur, from those we're prepared to demand that others must share. In some sense, then, the answer to the question, why wouldn't we simply treat some of our subjective preferences as ones that others must share in order to be judged desirable partners? The answer to that, in some sense, is that this is indeed precisely what we do. And that's what creates the curious conceptual hybrid category of moral properties and considerations in the first place. On this view of the matter, this hybrid character of the category of moral considerations bears the stamp of our evolutionary heritage. But it's more a clumsy and imperfect exaptation than an optimal adaptive solution to a problem faced by our phylogenetic ancestors. It's by now, oh, we're missing a couple things, aren't we? Um, it's, it's by now familiar that evolution is a tinkering process, one that works with materials that are already close to hand. It's plausible enough to think that among creatures who go in for cognitively complex forms of representation anyway, the most fundamental division embodied in their experience will have to be that between representations of how things stand in the world itself, representations that others must share on pain of somebody being wrong about something, and our merely subjective reactions to those states of the world, like pain or attitudes concerning ice cream flavors, that carry no such demand or even an expectation of intersubjective agreement. Surely this fundamental division was the background, phenomenological and conceptual framework into which moral properties, considerations, and commitments had to be fit by the conservative, tinkering process of evolution, and this in turn is why we find them so endlessly puzzling. Moral demands combine elements from each side of the fundamental division between the subjective and the objective in unprecedented ways. This puzzlement illustrates why moral cognition is perhaps an imperfect adaptation, but it need not be perfect in order to confer a selective advantage upon those who engage in it. Nonetheless, a potential problem for which I happen to have a slide, uh, will already occur to those of you who are familiar with the evolutionary literature on signaling and communication. Namely, why wouldn't people simply misrepresent their attitudes to appear to be more desirable interactive partners than they really are? There are three answers to this important worry. One is that such misrepresentation is not cost-free. Other members of the community will have a wide variety of more or less continuous opportunities, these happen all the time, right? to compare the actual behavior of each community member with the attitudes she has previously expressed about behavior and circumstances that were at the time merely reported, rumored, or counterfactual. And damaging the credibility of your advertisements is another way to risk being marked as an undesirable cooperative partner by others in the community. Access to cooperative interactions is a resource. It's a particularly important determinant of fitness in an organism within a group of default domain general cooperators. The more so, the higher the degree of cooperation within the group. And it appears that humans have been obligate 
cooperative social organisms for quite some time. So people have every reason to make claims very carefully about what they would have done in that person's shoes or if some counterfactual circumstance had obtained. And every reason to weigh the consequences carefully before deciding not to act as advertised. Secondly, people do exaggerate their moral integrity, uh, whether intentionally or not, in both, both ways, both intentionally and not. For example, while there, our predictions uh, tend to overestimate how ethically we ourselves will behave, our predictions about other people tend to be more accurate. But finally, and most importantly of all, <coughs> this concern about misrepresentation demonstrates a further way in which moral considerations must be externalized in order for our moral psychology to do its job effectively. It is because moral considerations are regarded as something more than mere subjective preferences that we can't escape blame or censure by changing them quickly, capriciously, without notice, or without good reason. That is, it's none of my business if you decide one day that you'd rather have a vanilla ice cream cone instead of a chocolate. You do not thereby do anything blameworthy for which I am entitled to find fault. But if you tell me you think it was wrong for so-and-so to abandon the camp instead of defending it, or to keep all the best nuts for herself, but then you proceed to do just the same thing in her position, your hypocrisy is itself a moral wrong over and above your cowardice or your greed. It's for this reason that the expression of a moral attitude serves not simply as a report of that attitude, but also a prima facie commitment not to deviate, not to deviate from the advertised course of conduct, absent some convincing further reason or rationale for doing so in a particular set of circumstances. In the absence of such a reason or rationale, it will not do to simply tell me after the fact that you changed your mind, as you well might about a mere subjective preference about ice cream, or whether you like to keep your head dry. This won't protect you from the deviation counting, both against your credibility on moral matters and against your desirability as a cooperative partner, denying you access to future opportunities for cooperative interaction. Thus, humans alone not only have the capacity to learn valuable information regarding likely future behavior from simple moralizing gossip about reported behavior and imagined behavior in counterfactual circumstances, but they also are able to secure actual, albeit implicit, commitments from others regarding such future behavior. And in this way, externalization allows us to coordinate the standards of conduct we demand both of ourselves and others. Now, this certainly doesn't mean that we should never expect to find people misrepresenting their actual moral commitments, intentionally or unintentionally, or changing their minds about them when push comes to shove. What it does mean is that we shouldn't expect to find people doing so capriciously, or casually, or without any sense that they're incurring a significant cost to do so. And we should expect to see people fail to act in accordance with moral commitments they have advertised, only when the potential further costs or benefits are comparatively high. We should expect to find that failures to act as advertised in moral matters trigger the condemnation and criticism of others and trigger moral emotions like shame or guilt in oneself, while such reactions should not be provoked either by failing to follow one's own previously expressed subjective preferences or by discovering that another person's subjective preferences have changed without notice. That's the contrast. We should expect failures to act as advertised in moral matters to become systematically more likely when an agent has reason to doubt that her actual behavior will be publicly revealed. And we should expect an agent's claims about what she would do in counterfactual circumstances to be treated as less convincing when the counterfactual circumstances are ones she has little reason to expect she will actually wind up occupying. We should expect humans to be particularly outraged by hypocrisy which I think is an otherwise puzzling obsession, because behavior may indeed be blameworthy, even if I myself could not resist engaging in it. But nonetheless, it's grounds for hypocrisy, it's grounds for criticism. Perhaps most importantly, wherever we find public exposure of a failure to behave as morally advertised, we should expect to find being practiced the fine art of parsing and interpreting situations as relevantly different from the one concerning which the advertised attitude was indeed advertised. Uh, perhaps needless to say, I think all of this is precisely what we do find. But I want to conclude by suggesting... Do I dare hit, hit the thing? Yes, I do. Good. 
I want to conclude by suggesting that this account need not, and I think should not, be seen to hold that moral objectivity is somehow an illusion or an error. It's open to us instead, and I think it's the right road, to insist that the distinctive characteristics we associate with moral demands are not consequences of their objectivity, but are instead constitutive of it. That is, the fact that moral violations are treated as more serious, more punishable than merely conventional ones. The fact that we're willing to impose moral demands on people in other times and places, whether pe on people whether they care about them or not, that we regard them as other people as subject to them independently of any uh, of decree or uh, conventional authority. And the fact, the fact that we treat our attitudes about moral commitments as constituting genuine commitments regarding our own future behavior. And the fact that we demand that others share our commitments on pain of being judged undesirable partners for cooperative or exploitable interactions. We can insist, I think, that these just are what objectivity is and always has been in the moral domain. On this account, moral objectivity is perhaps created rather than destroyed, but if so, or rather than discovered, but if so, it's not created by us, but by the processes of biological and cultural evolution that have produced the cognitive apparatus that has engaged the world. And it's as real as anything else that's created by those processes. I also don't think the account suggests that, uh, that moral pro progress is somehow an illusion. Uh, it's the conceptual category of moral demands that evolution bequeaths to us, rather than the specific standards of behavior that we demand be satisfied by ourselves and by desirable partners. Much like a natural language, those specific standards of behavior will surely be acquired in early childhood with substantial input from a surrounding culture. But they'll also be subject to change over time in response to demands of consistency, unanticipated consequences, and other tools of rational argument. These are part of the process of cultural evolution by which some standards of behavior come to be accepted as moral standards and others lose that status. They're not to be set in opposition to it. They're not autonomous from it. They're part of it. Now, perhaps it remains possible that beyond all this, there's a special domain or third realm of platonic moral truths and properties to which human beings or some particular group of human beings somehow have access. Or that how things stand in that special domain somehow determines what constitutes genuine morality for us, even if no humans have any access to it. But if we have an appealing alternative account of moral externalization and objectivity on the table, perhaps we're finally in a position to say simply that we have no need of that hypothesis. In this famous painting, Plato points to the heavens, but I think we can make sense of everything that's going on while confining our attention to what's actually happening in the painting itself. Thanks. So, I just want to push you a little bit on what you want to call this objectivity rather than just intersubjectivity. Rather than just, just intersubjectivity? Yeah, sure. just intersubjectivity. So, I mean, uh, within moral communities, you know, even the same points in time, we can have disagreements between those communities about what are the relevant moral considerations we ought to have, all this sort of stuff. So, what, why do we get to call this uh, objective and then just say one party's wrong rather than, uh, or one group is wrong rather than just intersubjective. And these are things that we uh, uh, not quite project onto the world, but we agree are, are these moral objects that uh, we more or less create through so, some sort of social process. So there's a really important sense in which I don't care what we call it, yeah. right? And uh, similarly in which right, the, the extent, extended argument is an argument that Right. What we think of, and philosophers have for a long time tried to explain as, as the special kind of moral objectivity, is a sort of demand for intersubjectivity. But it's not the same way we use that expression either, right? We can talk about a demand for, for shared intersubjective preferences about things that aren't moral, and things that we don't treat, externalize in this way, right? So 
again, what, what I want to, I think what's really going on is that there's this funny hybrid category, right? Mm -hmm. And so I don't ultimately want to um, identify uh, the, um, let's go back. I, I don't ultimately want to identify, how far back do we have to go back? Oh right, that's one of the that's one of the ones that ain't. Sorry, um, <laughs> no, none of us are going to see it. The uh, the uh, I don't want to identify um, the the phenomenon under discussion here, right? With e either of the things I'm trying to point to that were on that missing slide, right? Either the traditional category of objective, the cat is on the mat kinds of considerations, right? Um, or uh, the things that we see as our subjective reactions to the world. They occupy this kind of middle ground. And so the, the motivation for even bringing objectivity talk in here at all is, I think, this puzzling feature that I insist existing uh, evolutionary approaches don't do a good job with. Right? The, the thing that's outstanding there that they seem to have failed on are the features that this puzzling hybrid category that seems to push it towards, or there are ways in which we treat it like judgments about the cat being on the mat. I do expect you to share my judgment that there's a chair over there. And if we disagree about that, it's a signal that something's gone wrong. The interesting bit is, in the, um, uh, in the moral case, the, it, it's a signal for a very different reason, right? In the, the cat is on the mat kind of case, right, it's a signal one of us either has a screwed up perceptual system or we've made a mistake or we weren't careless or something like that. And so I need to attend to that disagreement between us because it's a signal that something's wrong. In the case of moral disagreement, it's also a signal that something's wrong. That's what makes one of the things that makes the moral category like the objective category, but for a very different reason. It's not that I can uh, presume that, that anybody whose apparatus is functioning correctly should perceive the world the same way I, I do. It's that I want to restrict my exploitable interaction to only people who do. Right? So it has some features of that objective category, but for a very different reason. No, I have nothing more invested than that in saying, this is objectivity. This is what moral objectivity is. I think we understand the thing now. The name doesn't matter. Yeah, Chris, right? Yeah, Chris. Um, so, um, so, just sort of following up on Ryan's question there. So, you could have a situation where society uh, views the importance between chocolate and vanilla ice cream as equally important as uh, other moral factors. And for, for example, a lot of religions have a lot of food restrictions that are historical and, and seem as important as other, other moral factors. Uh, and then, I mean, obviously, people that are within uh, a Nazi community will see and will want to interact with other Nazis. So, is essentially there is no content whatsoever, or, or we think there's biases in terms of what evolution has given us for for moral characters? Or? Uh, so, so. The second half of that is an empirical question, and it's an empirical question that I certainly don't have and I don't think anybody has really great evidence on at the moment. Uh, it may well be that certain kinds of moral reactions are more or less hardwired into us, right? Certain kinds of disgust reactions, right? And, and uh, some, of the, uh, some of the most fun kinds of examples you can give are sort of irrational disgust reactions that seem uh, what evolutionary psychologists call cognitively impenetrable, right? That's what's interesting about those examples is that, you know, knowing that the sterilized cockroach isn't dangerous or, right, realizing that the, the spit in this glass is the same as the saliva in your, in your significant other's mouth, but you'll French kiss her, but you won't drink the spit, right? This is cognitively impenetrable. It doesn't make any difference to how you feel about it, right? So maybe, right, maybe there, there are, uh, there's specific moral content that's sort of hardwired into us. But that's not what I've been concerned with here, right? And you're quite right that whatever else is true, the account has to make room for tremendous, massive variation in the content, right? So that's why it's important that as I was moving a little quickly to try to emphasize at the end, what this is really intended to explain is why you need two categories in the first place. Why have two? Why can't we do everything just using subjective preferences, right? And then this is also why I was suggesting it we, we ought not think of uh, you know, the activity of traditional moral philosophy as somehow um, uh, uh, just utterly disconnected from uh, the, the 
actual change in, in moral views over time. That's part and parcel of maybe a particularly sophisticated version of the part of processes of cultural evolution whereby right, some moral, moral or specific contentful attitudes come into or come get kicked out of the special category. Right? That, that, there's an interesting dynamical, uh, uh, surely an interesting dynamical process uh, story to tell about that uh, too. But I think the, the, the mystery that it's very hard to get purchase on is why do you need two categories in the first place? And that's what I think we hope to have done, done some work on here. Nice, just, I mean, it, it is part of your project at this point, I and mean, you're just, as you put it, showing why you need the extra category. Uh, but it would be very useful to see how to go from where you've gotten us to how we can get uh, defending and objectifying moral judgments about moral change. Uh, I think it's really important that we be able to do that. And if part of your dismissing the Socratic thing requires dismissing that, then that's not good enough. So I'm inclined to agree, but I think that, that the issue has to be handled really carefully. And I, and I think, uh, in a way, there's something, I suspect there's something of that same impulse tied up with. Ryan's original question, why call yes, this yes, that's, what I think. Right? that's yeah. exactly what I thought. And I'm utterly sympathetic, right? But I, I but I, I think I think it's tricky, right? Um, there are so we've got right one thing is, as I was, was just saying, right, it, the sorts of tools that we think of as enabling us to make um, make moral progress, the tools of rational argument, unintended consequences, and considerations of consistency and all the rest of it, right? Um, those are part of how change happens. Change isn't progress all by itself, right? Now, it's going to be true that there, there are going to be well-defined senses in which any particular moral set, set of moral commitments count as superior to others, right? But that's going to depend on other things held in common. So what we're not going to be able to do is start from nothing against a moral skeptic and defend one set of moral commitments as superior to another. But that's not really news, right? And so um, it's, I think it's important not to, to conflate the kind of uh, status that moral commitments or moral demands have on this sort of account of them with, uh, by, by putting the challenge to it that it would have to enable us to do that, right? I can perfectly well defend one moral commitment as superior to another in traditional ways that I do, but that's by assuming that you and I share uh, other, other normative commitments. And so um, that sort of sui generis defense of the superiority of one set of moral commitments over another just isn't required for moral progress to be genuine by our own lights. When we start talking moral progress, I think we're, the defense of that is always going to have to take place from within a set of moral commitments rather than from standing outside all of them. But in a way, that's an old lesson in philosophy. So I agree with you. Um, I think the way you said it was that's not good enough if we just have to give up on the idea that we're making genuine, that, that we have progress rather than change or something like that. I think we don't have to give up on that, right? But we're, we also not, uh, can't make uh, the, the project of defending it um, so ambitious that it's destined to fail. Right? That, that would, be, would be unfair to ask that at this account, too. Um, so this is sort of following along the same line. I guess I, I want to pin down how you, how different a category you take uh, these these moral beliefs to be, um, particularly because the, the way you ended seemed to go in a slightly different direction than how I took you started with like the the stuff from Coors Garden and such. So. Um, one way of thinking about uh, the kinds of moral attitude, of moral beliefs that uh, you take to be ascribed to this intersubjectivity idea, you can think of, well, they're, they're beliefs about other people's beliefs, in some sense, right? So you, you want coordination about uh, a moral, 
An important component to my moral thinking is how I think about what other people think about if I were to do something, right? So um, I might not like to steal, not just because I have a personal preference like ice cream, but also I think other people aren't going to like it if I steal. I have expectations that other people expect me to not do that. So, uh, so or maybe, maybe I'm getting go off. Go where you're going, so, I'll see if it matters so, uh, where I'm, I think that's where So I'm just trying to connect what you're saying here to maybe this is a, an elaboration of some, what some people want to say in the social norms literature about how to talk about moral norms, mm -hmm. okay? Um, but, I want, but it seems like from where you started, you don't necessarily want to do that exactly. Uh, and so I want to see what you have to say about something like um, how we think about the value of money, say. Okay. So money, like, like a dollar bill has, or dollar coin here, has, has, stored, has stored value because we say it does, right? Um, we get to do stuff with it because we've all decided that the dollar bill has a certain amount of exchange with normal goods or with other currencies and things like this. If we stop believing that, it stops being true, right? So that's how you can have currency runs and all this business. Like, there's no, like, it's, it's all fiat currency these days. There's nothing real backing it up other than our beliefs about it. So um, is that, do you want to say something different about the objectivity of the of moral beliefs? So I, ha I haven't, or, uh, or are they going to be the same kind of thing as mine? I haven't thought, thought through the comparison, but I can tell you what, what uh, falls off the top of my head. So, so first of all, the reason I was a little nervous about your initial description sure. is, uh, is, right, I, I was casting this in terms of attitudes, and the, uh, the setup is not supposed to be that, that what, just what we're adding is either beliefs or attitudes about other people's beliefs or attitudes, right? It's a, it's a requirement or a demand that other people have the same attitudes that I do. Right, that I'm using in this criterial way. Uh, and so I was worried about us sort of changing the subject in a funny way by trying to make it too close to the social norms. Sure. But I, I don't think uh, that difference will matter for, for pursuing the, the parallel of money, right? So, uh, and, and the way in which I think, uh, the, the, the thing that strikes me right off the bat as a, a important, a really important difference, right? I mean, the, the thing that you're, you're focused on about the money example, which is right, it has, money, it has value because we say it does, and we all act accordingly, right? Uh, whereas on this account, um, moral demands aren't quite like that. Why not? Uh, so the way you put it about money is it's true because we say it's true. There's, there are important things here that are not true because we say they are. And those are things like the requirements for stable, cooperative interaction within a group. That we don't get to decide on. And what's required in order to not get exploited by, by cooperative partners within a group. That's what we don't get. We don't get to decide on that. And that's what's driving um, the demands between, the, the demands for shared, uh, shared moral uh, attitudes between people. Now, so look, a uh, long time ago, Nice. Um, right. Alan Gibbard uh, argued in uh, Wise Choices Act Feelings, very uh, convincingly and interestingly, I think, that what moral attitudes were for was were for coordination within a uh, uh, within a group, coordinating my expectations about your behavior, what the emotions we're both going to feel if I don't, and so on. Right. That something strikes me as right about that, um, in line with this. But it's, the, the suggestion strikes me as radically underdeveloped. I mean, the, the sort of thing it doesn't have is the ability to say how we get this off the ground in, in the first place and answer this question of, or what, right? We, we, we fail to coordinate, or what? Now we know, or what? We, we court people with whom we are not coordinated, we reject as undesirable cooperative partners. And the reasons that that's the right thing to do about these moral demands, that we didn't decide. That's not up to us. That, that isn't true because we decided that it's true. Right? Now, it may be the case, so, so this is where maybe the, the, the content category thing I was going, uh, talking to Chris about uh, comes in too. It, it may well be that what, just what you need is stable agreement on some set, right? that there's nothing who's, that uh, no view whose actual content needs to be in there, and in that sense, we get to decide what's in the special category. right? Uh, that might be right. But the, the need for the special category itself 
is created by the, um, by the existence of a group of organisms who are default domain general cooperators. Right? That's what fixes the need for the special category, not that we decided we'd like to have things a certain way or something like that. Because default domain general cooperation is not stable without the demand for shared attitudes towards, towards instances of behavior. So that's a quick, that's my a quick thought, but I think it's, yes? Thanks for your talk. Uh, just following up on the question so far. So I think I'm confused about um, the way you're using the term objectivity. It seems mm -hmm. like on the one hand you have a, a sort of um, a history of how we've come to develop the term or what, how we use it. And on the other hand, um, there's a definition of what it, what it is. And I think that that distinction is important to be clear on. Uh, because it seems like it seems like it's easy to sort of slip into gating content for what is objectively right or wrong from a story about how it how we came to think of things, mm -hmm. how we how we developed a capacity to say project um, objectivity onto things in the world. So if it's the case that we sort of blend those two, then it seems like mm -hmm. objective right and wrong get tied too closely to say fitness, biological fitness. Um, and it seems like a lot of accounts tend to make that error when they move from biological stories about objectivity to what the content of morality is. And I think it's, so if you could make that a bit more clear, I know it's kind of been coming out in these other questions, so I apologize. <laughs> no, 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 not at all. I mean, yeah, so, so I mean, part of what you're, <laughs> you're worried about there is, is this um, sort of troubling history of the naturalistic fallacy Right? And, and saying, oh, I have an expl explanation for why this would have been evolutionarily advantageous, that makes it good, right? Uh, and yeah, I really don't mean to be advancing any, any kind of claim like that. And I'm not sure, so what gives me pause is I'm not sure I'd be inclined to set up what I'm doing as a matter of this um, sort of a, a story about how we use the term objectivity and a story about what it really is. I'm not sure how to understand the latter thing in any case. What I think I can do, right, um, I, I don't have a dog in the fight of what uh, moral objectivity tr truly is independent of how we've come to, to think about it. I don't have a dog in the fight of what, or at least not today or right now, what specific moral views we ought to hold. I suppose I, I and everybody have a dog in that fight, but not today, right? Uh, the, um, right? What I think we can do is explain why we have come to experience the world in the way that we do, experience moral demands in the way that we do, and what it was about that experience that led us to want to insist right, that there are something more than just our preferences, that they are binding on us in a way that just what we happen to like or want isn't. And in a way, right, the, the push for moral objectivity throughout the history of philosophy has been very centrally grounded in that, right? This distinction between what I want to do and what, in some sense, I have to do whether I want it or not, right? And I think what this machinery gives us the ability to do is to understand why we have moral experience in those terms. So I think we can understand our moral phenomenology. Now, in keeping with the linguistic turn in philosophy, lots of moral philosophy has been about what moral language means. What does it mean when you say this is good or this is bad? One thing, so uh, I could say, look, these are the features, in a Humean fashion, these are the features we've been responding to all along. So that's what it means. I could say, these are the features that we've been responding to all along, and that doesn't determine, in a non-Humean fashion, right? And that, and that doesn't determine anything about what moral objectivity really is. But I'm not sure I have anything to say about that, partly because I'm not primarily concerned with the meaning of moral language here in the first place, right? And I think that's what gets, tricks us into thinking, uh, that's pejorative, that's what leads us into thinking, oh, we need to carefully distinguish between how, we're, right, how we come to think about this and what it really is. It's the focus on language. But what I'm interested in trying to explain here is the character of moral phenomenology, moral psychology, and moral experience. And I think we do that by this machinery. We explain both 
right? Uh, why we came to have the distinctive category, this distinctive and in, in many ways strange hybrid category of moral demands that have these uh, features traditionally associated with objective representations of the world, features associated with our subjective reactions to the world, um, and why we came to have it, right? Uh, going on from there to address the, a further question about what it really is, that just hasn't been part of the story here, or what our moral language really means, right? You could also say, look, this is what it really means because it's what we've been responsive to all along, but that's a story about language, which I haven't un undertaken, right? Now, one interesting sort of contrast to think about here, I think, is with epistemological norms. Right? That's another place where I think we get this strange kind of hybrid, right? because we've got, well, it's, there's something more than just what I happen to think about them. They put demands on people. There's a crucial difference, though, in the two. So I, I think epistemological norms are also an interesting hybrid category of this kind. I don't think moral, moral norms are the only one. But there's a really interesting distinction. At the end of the day, I believe, and you believe, that if other people fail to follow my good epistemological advice, the world pushes back. The world pushes back. Your bad epistemological practice will come back to bite you. And so ultimately, right, if, if I can't talk you into it, right, talk you into accepting my good epistemological advice, I can say, okay, right, do it your way. And the sense in which I think you'll be screwing it up is that I think the world will eventually punish you. In a way, the most deeply puzzling thing about moral normativity or moral objectivity, is that no such thing like that is true. Uh, moral demands are paradigmatically causally inert. Their causal power only goes by way of other people's attitudes. Right? So it's not that they do nothing, but it's only by way of what other people think. Right? Slavers and Nazis do pragmatically just as well as the rest of us. Maybe better if their slavery and Nazism is tolerated by the rest of us. So that, in a way, that's part of the puzzle, that contrast with the epistemological case, right? is I cannot stand back and say, well, okay, do it your way, right? The world's going to punish you, and that's the sense in which I think you're getting it wrong. You cannot do that in the moral case, because we have no guarantee, no, no even background expectation that the world is going to punish you for doing it wrong, right? It's, that's only going to happen if other people do. In a way, that's the suggestion about this hybrid category, it's those standards of behavior that other people are, are going to uphold. Yeah, Chris again? There's no one else. Yeah. I want to violate the moral norms here. <laughs> you don't have to hold the door for me anyway. I just had a question about the, uh, the Real Housewives case. Um, what, what will now, in the canons of philosophy, be called the real housewife? Yeah, I, I think that was, you were jumping at that. Uh, it seems that in a lot of cases, uh, with uh, Jersey Shore and even historical examples like Billy the Kid or Bonnie and Clyde, we seem to venerate uh, outrageously uh, egregious norm violation. And it seems that um, in these cases, not only is it sort of from a fire that we say, oh, there's something we like about that, and the gossip makes sense in terms of we want to talk about it and, and bring it out, but if we were to meet a lot of these people, I think people would say, you know, if someone came up to you from Jersey Shore and said, I need like $10 because I just went and did this crazy thing and I'm all in money, people would be happy to give it to them so they could say, hey, I gave this money to, you know, Snooky or whatever, and, you know, some sort of, and I know Let's that's... painfully concede that that's probably true. That's probably true, and, and it may just be due to fame, but the thing is, too, people in these situations are often famous purely for breaking these norms that you've described as being reasons why we would want to interact with certain people and not others. Yet in these cases, it seems that there's a general trend in the population who want to interact with these famous people and say, hey, you'll never guess who I saw doing this outrageous thing. And even, even not in, in famous cases, but just having a friend that is outrageous or crazy, people like to have them and say, yeah, I want to... You know, this friend does crazy things, I love going out with them, I want to interact with them. I'll even give him 20 bucks when he runs out of money from doing crazy things or something like that. And so how does that kind of... If you're fit? advertising for friends here, I want <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I'm, I'm looking like for to do crazy things and get paid. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, look, that's a, this is a fair point, but it seems to me there are a couple of, de of delicate issues entangled there, right? One of them is, 
uh, there, there's a danger here of being too closely focused on uh, the specifics of our own uh, uh, moral attitudes, right? And one thing that is almost by design lacking from this story, right? There, if you look at moral attitudes more broadly than just uh, ones that tend to be popular in, in uh, Western liberal democracies, um, right, you find much less emphasis on norms of uh, uh, harm and fairness and much more on norms of identity and conformity and uh, trustworthiness and reliance, right? And so uh, it's a mistake, I think, to tie a, a story about the need for the categories and a, a need for um, this sort of common standard uh, too closely to any specific um, attitude, which is, I think, what we're talking about when we say, hey, we, sometimes we venerate, uh, right? I think, I think that's a local, uh, uh, local content, right, to a particular moral norm. And there's surely a story to tell about that. Surely the story is complicated about how, well, maybe we think the official advertised norms are sort of behind what we actually admire a little bit of, uh, a little bit of law breaking and, you know, that's okay with me and you, even if it's not okay with the church lady, and so we're sort of carving out a little slightly different group of interaction. There's surely a horribly complicated story about that. And I actually think what's going to be much more informative than, huh, what would I say if Snooky wanted to borrow $20 from me? Let's pretend I know who Snooky is. Uh, the, uh, I think what's going to be much more informative is what we actually know about um, patterns of gossip in more traditional societies, and it, which actually turns out to be quite a bit. It's very interesting what people talk about. I gave you a little bit of a, of a hint about that. But it uh, strikes me as strength, right? So but what we want to do is not focus on the particular norms being upheld in a particular conversation, but the subjects, right? They're, it's that they're worrying about coordination, cooperative behavior, expectations, rationales, justifications, right? And that seems to be true no matter what uh, the, the particular norms that are uh, upheld in a particular community are. Right. So that, that's why I wanted to sort of disentangle this. Well, I'm afraid our, our time has, has come to a close. I'd like to thank you all for your questions, for, for joining us today, and, and please join me in thanking uh, Professor Stanford.